Hello and welcome everybody to uh, this diagram webinar. We're going to just give people one more minute to come in and then we will start. Okay, welcome again, everybody. My name is Julie Noblet. I'm the Community Manager for the Diagram Center, and I'm really delighted to welcome you to today's webinar, Tactile Graphics with a Voice. Our speaker today is Richard Ladner from the University of Washington, who will be talking to you about some exciting research he completed last year uh, uh, un uh, under the umbrella of the Diagram Center at the University of Washington. If the Diagram Center is new to you, uh, I just want to say a quick word to orient you to who we are. Um, Benetech is a nonprofit social enterprise based here in Silicon Valley. We develop technology in service of human rights, global literacy, and environment. Uh, and we, along with our partners at the National Center for Accessible Media at WGBH in Boston and uh, the U.S. Fund for DAISY, we're an OSEP-funded R&D project. And our goal is to make it easier, faster, and cheaper to create and use accessible images. So Dr. Ladner's work with tactile graphics that he'll be talking about today fits this goal uh, beautifully, as you're soon going to hear from him. Just a quick word about uh, of housekeeping. Uh, if you would like to download these slides and follow them on your own, you can find them right now at diagramcenter.org slash webinars. Um, because we have many, many registrants for our webinar today, there are um, about 80 people here. Uh, we have publishers, teachers, students, uh, and many more. Uh, in order for everyone to have the best audio experience, all of you have been placed on mute, so you can hear us, but we won't be able to hear you. So if you have questions as we go along, please type your question into the little chat window that should appear on the left of your screen. And if you'd like to practice uh, doing that right now, just type a greeting into the chat uh, say hello to us. Let us know that you're there. We are going to collect your questions as we go along and answer them during the Q&A portion that will come at the end of the webinar. We're going to reserve uh, 10 minutes or so. Our session today is 60 minutes. Um, if you need to leave before the end, that's no problem. A recording of the webinar, along with the PowerPoint slides, are going to be made available on the Diagram webinar page in a couple of weeks, so you can come back and listen it, to it at your leisure or share it with colleagues. So, with no further ado, let me turn it over to uh, Richard uh, to talk about tactile graphics with a voice. Richard? Uh, great. Thank you, Julie, so much. And uh, I'm, I'm looking right now at all the people coming in and saying hello and hello back to all of you. And there's a few familiar names in there as well. So I do notice that some of the people who are participating in this webinar are, are blind. So I'll do my best to, to make this uh, talk accessible. Um, I will say a little bit of background um, that I've been working on tactile graphics since about 2004. Uh, when a blind student came here to the University of Washington, and I, I realized that this was an impediment to his learning. And my main thrust has been to try and make the figures in textbooks uh, accessible. So let's go to the next slide, slide two. Um, on this slide is a typical page from a pre-calculus book. It has maybe 800 pages in the book, and there's approximately 1,200 images. There's a lot of math. There's a lot of text, and I've highlighted those components. 
And we kind of know how to do text. Uh, we have uh, optical character recognition, or if you're lucky, the text in the book is in an accessible format in the first place uh, using a DAISY format or EPUB 3. Uh, the math is a little more difficult, uh, but there are math OCRs uh, that can read math and convert it to an accessible format. Um, of course, reading math is always a challenge. How do you read it out loud? Um, or you could view it in Braille uh, as an option, and I know that that student I talked about did that, uh, viewed the math in a Braille format. Uh, it wasn't Mammoth code, he just directly looked at the LaTeX uh, form himself. And then we have the images, and these images can be quite complicated. And uh, one way to access an image would be to have perhaps a, 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 a description of it. But uh, this is a pretty challenging image, the one I'm showing here. It, uh, it shows um, the intersection of uh, four hyperplanes. Two are the X and Y axis. One is a vertical line and one is a diagonal line, and they each have an equation associated with them. So, um, so tactile graphic is, is something that you can feel, that there will be some parts that are embossed and some parts uh, that are just flat. There might be textures, for example, to show the area that you're trying to show. In the picture here, it's sort of a color orange that might be textured. Um, there's also text in the image, and the text in the image has to be converted to something that is accessible, perhaps Braille, or maybe it could be spoken out loud. So the tactile graphics with the voice is looking at that alternative. How could we speak? the text that's in these images. By the way, almost every image in this book had about 1,200 images. All but about 50 had some text in them, so it's, it's, it's very common. And you can't really understand the image without the text. Let me go to the next slide. So I'm going to talk a little bit about tactile perception. And uh, so I have a picture of two hands here, and we can see the way I think about tactile perception is that uh, this, these two hands have a, a ten little eyeballs. That uh, this is our somatosensory system, sense of touch. Those those sensors and your fingers, they can sense textures. They can sense embossing, like lines that are embossed. Uh, they can, of course, sense braille, the little raised dots and so on, so they're, they're, they're actually able to look. And um, that sort of gets us started. So let's go to the next slide. But what are the tactile perception limitations? Well, it's well known that the resolution of the human fingertips is, is not high. It's not like the visual perception. So here I say it's 25 DPI dots per inch. And that's been verified um, scientifically. A tactile field of perception is no bigger than the size of your fingertips, so it has a very small field of view. And then color information, if there is color information, in, can be replaced by texture. And you know, different textures can represent different colors. Now, if you have a lot of colors, a lot of different hues or something like that, there might be some problems with that. But if you have a fixed number of colors, you know, five or six colors, you should be able to come up with some textures to represent those colors. And then the visual bandwidth, it might be a million bits per second, but tactile bandwidth is only 100 bits per second. So you just can't get as much information per second as you can with the visual bandwidth. So there are all these sort of limitations. Nonetheless, you can get a lot of information. Um, let's move on to slide five. So in slide five, I talk about a resolution study that was done a number of years ago, and there's a reference in the notes. Um, so there were these, uh, these vertical lines that could be close together, a little further apart or a little further apart, and the images show 0.35 millimeters, one millimeter, and two millimeters, but you might have a bunch more. And you could ask somebody, can you distinguish them? And if you can't, then you, that's sort of the limit of your tactile acuity. So the results from this paper that I reference is on average blind participants could sense about one millimeter separation but no smaller. And on average, uh, sighted participants could sense about 1.5 millimeter separation. But that's a difference. 
And I think it's mostly because of experience that uh, blind people are using their, their tactile sense a lot more than sighted people. So that also, those numbers, one millimeter and 1.5 millimeter, are very informative in terms of how much resolution you really need on, say, a, a tactile, excuse me, an embossing printer. Um, so that would be about 25 dots per inch, seems about. So I'm going to the next slide. Um, so a little bit more about blind spatial perception. And I do have a couple of references uh, that talk about this uh, in the notes, in the slides. So tactile perception can lead to a spatial model in the brain. That is, on the left I show a picture of an embossed parabola with a finger touching it. And of course it can't sense the whole parabola at once. And you might use multiple fingers, for example. Hands. But as you sense that with your fingers, you, you put together a mental model in your head. And I've, I've tried this with a lot of kids, you know, young kids and, you know, at different uh, things, and they actually can do that. Maybe it's not a parabola, but I give them a square, and they can say it's a square and so on. So they can actually perceive different shapes. So on the right, I show a picture of the brain and that shape sort of showing up um, on top of the brain. So blind people can have spatial understanding. And I think anybody who's blind on this call knows that already. But in case you don't know it, uh, there is a lot of scientific evidence that that's true. Those references uh, show that. For example, one of the references I mentioned is a, is a study in Nature, in the, nat in the journal Nature, which shows that people who are reading Braille activate their primary visual cortex. That's your primary visual cortex. That is the part of the brain where you bring in information from your eyeballs. So there you go. So your finger is like an eyeball. So you can see that I'm a strong advocate of tactile perception. So in the next picture, this is slide seven in the deck. There's two images. The one on the left is the original graph, or the original graphic I showed you a, a way back that has the, it's the intersection of four um, half planes. And it has text on it. It has uh, different colors uh, and so on. One, one color shows the intersection. On the right is a tactile version of it. Whatever's black is embossed. It's raised a little bit above the surface. And um, all the text in this has been converted to Braille. Um, and then the area that had a color is now texturized. You can feel the texture. And so the text that corresponds to this uh, a figure that might be in the textbook itself, uh, it might talk about these different parts of this, this uh, diagram. And somebody looking at this diagram with their fingers, tactually perceiving it, will be able to understand it and also see the textual elements in the diagram. So that's a tactile graphic. That's the thing on the right. And that's a typical one. Um, I'm not going to say how they're produced typically uh, because um, uh, we're going to, you know, get to that a little bit later. Oh, I am going to talk about it. Excuse me. The next slide, slide eight, is a typical tactile graphics kit that I've seen around. This one, I don't know who makes this particular one. But you can see there's a lot of little tools and there's little handicraft things. Uh, there may be some, there's some, Stuff on the right here in the bottom right, which is a metal thing that you could do some embossing on the metal and maybe make a negative for doing something later to make copies of it. So you can see his handwork. You know, it's not on the computer. Let's move to slide nine. So here on slide nine, I wanted to mention three uh, technologies for actually producing the end product of a tactile graphic. You have kind of the image, you have everything ready to go, where do you print it? You might have an embossing printer, and it just, instead of printing ink, it pushes the paper and makes things rise a little bit. So it would be fairly sturdy paper that you would have to use. There's a thermoform process. I mentioned creating a negative. Once you have the negative, you can put some uh, sort of plastic-like paper on top of it and do a heat process, and it slumps, and now you have something embossed. And the final one is swell paper, and there's a picture of it there. Uh, you just draw on with, let's say, black ink or dark ink on white paper on this special swell paper, and then you put it through a heat process, 
and what's black raises up and becomes embossed, and what's not black uh, doesn't raise up. So the Braille doesn't come out so well with swell paper because, uh, you know, it's a little bit uh, uh, low-tech. But um, nonetheless, uh, these are the three options that are, that are out there. And there may be other options as well, but these are the most popular ones that I'm aware of. Um, so let's go to the next slide, slide 10. So one particular printer that I'm, I'm used to is the one here at the University of Washington that I'll, I'll mention. Uh, in fact, I noticed that John Gardner is one of the people on the line, so I'm, I'm very proud of you, John, that you invented the Tiger Embosser. It's about 20 dots per inch. Uh, it has seven height levels, but from my studies, only about three or four are really distinguishable. Um, it, of course, you can print textures, uh, so uh, the levels are helpful, but you can do other things as well to get uh, you know, the different colors that I mentioned earlier. It prints Braille text and graphics. So it does the Braille very nicely and, and does the graphics. Um, if, if I had a document that was, say, in, a, um, in a, an understandable format for this printer, like a Adobe Illustrator document, then it prints it very nicely. We've done this many times. Uh, so it does print dot patterns for texture. And um, as I mentioned, it was invented by this blind physicist, John Gardner looking to see if he wrote a note there. <laughs> um, so congratulations, John. And there's other uh, embossing printers around. It's just this is the one that we've used here at the University of Washington. If you've never seen one before, be sure and, and go look at one. They're, they're really, really nice. By the way, when I visited Japan, there was a completely different embossing printer I saw over there. And the Braille is slightly different, for example. There's also, on uh, the next slide, slide 11, uh, there's a refreshable tactile display. I've seen this in, in real life, but only in Japan when I visited there. I've never seen it here. Oh, I, I, I take that back. I did, see a, I did see a version of this at the National Federation of the Blind uh, room where they have a lot of technology. So it's a dot view DV2, and it has pretty low resolution. I think it's like... Uh, 40 by 32 or something like that. I can't remember the actual one. So it's a very small image uh, that you can put on there. Um, also, the, the the distance between the dots is fairly large. It's not as tight as, for example, the embossing printer I mentioned. So it's a kind of a rough, low-resolution uh, thing, and it's not very big. So um, it, it's not as useful as it would seem. Plus, I believe it's very, very expensive. I think a real challenge for people would be to build a, a good size one with higher resolution, so say 10 inch by 10 inch uh, screen, a uh, refreshable screen, and then um, and have it be as relatively inexpensive. I've seen some nice work at the National Braille Press that they're trying to build one, and everybody I know that does technology, I say build one of these. This is going to be, but right now, so far as I know, this is the best one. That I'm aware of that's sort of where you can purchase it. I'm going to move on to slide 12, and we're back to that tactile graphics I talked at the very beginning. And I'm just circling here the, the one tactile graphic. So how, you know, you have this book, 1,000-plus images in it. You did every one of those by hand using that, um, you know, that kit I showed you earlier. Boy, that would take a long time. Uh, if you did all that Braille by punching the Braille one dot at a time, it would, it would take hours to do these figures, or to do one of these figures, excuse me, hours and maybe months to years to do the whole book. So what I tried to do, and the student inspired me to do back in 2004, was to try and accelerate this process, make this go much, much faster, so that you can, you can take the whole book and do all the figures in the book. And... Uh, at that time, of course, we were just uh, we didn't we weren't doing tactile graphics with a voice. We were just producing these things so that the amount X would come out in Braille. The image wouldn't be a tiny little image, but it would be 10 by 10, and it would be very accessible. Who was a Braille reader? Um, so in the next slide, slide 13, I show a little bit about the process. And it's a little bit technical, 
but I'll try to explain it. So we have our original image on the left. Uh, we do some pre-processing to make it. So in, in our case, we had this image. We did not have a digital version of this image. So we actually had to scan it from the book. And then we pre-process the scanned image to get rid of the noise to make it cleaner so that we could do a process to extract the text. And that was our own invention here at the University of Washington. And then from the extraction, we got all the text as a pure image. That's in the bottom. Then we had the pure graphics, all the text is removed. And then we have the, what we call the location file, which shows um, where the, those textual elements were in the original image. And notice also there's some scaling factors to make the image bigger, so we don't want it to be as small. So we might stretch the image in the, the X and Y direction directions and by different amounts, although there's an option to do it in the same amount if you had a, a really a geometric diagram that you really wanted to. That would be scaling by, the, the scaling numbers would be the same in that case. Here they're very close, actually. Um, so now we have these three components here. So let's go to slide 14. And there are the three components again, the location file, the pure graphic, and the text as an image. Um, so now we have this text as an image, we can do optical character recognition and get out text as text and then do Braille conversion to get Braille. And I noticed that uh, the Braille, it didn't come out looking like Braille here. That's the ASCII codes for the Braille there. So uh, it turns out that Julie's computer uh, didn't have the Braille fonts when she put that onto her computer. I didn't even check that, but I should have. So now you have the Braille, you have the original graphic without any text in it, and you have the location. And then you merge those three together into one element. Luckily, there's software that already exists to do that merging step. Adobe Illustrator like allows you to write scripts. Merging step at the end. We didn't have to write any software for that. So the only software we wrote was to remove the text and figure out where that text belongs in, in the image that we're going to produce. So I can tell you this is a lot of uh, C++ code. Uh, some students worked on it over a number of years, and it's been perfected. And a lot of technology that goes into this whole process that I – so in the next slide, I have kind of a, a work diagram of of the entire process. And I'm not going to go through this in too much detail because it would be kind of boring, but I, I will show you a few components. So in the upper middle is what we call the TGA. That's the Tactile Graphics Assistant. And there, that's where we, uh, we extract the text, the text from the image. And notice that that's there, but there's some training. So to do that, we actually use what's called machine learning in a computer training images where we train on what the text looks like, and then it does it automatically. But of course, it doesn't do a perfect job, so you have to do some quality checking and do the editing. So that's where the human is involved. The human is involved in this editing. Similarly for optical character recognition below, when you take the text, so out of that box came three things, right? The location file, scale factors, and text as an image, and then the pure graphic came out of that. Um, now we have the optical character recognition. Well, OCR is not perfect. There has to be some time to put in some effort there. And then Braille translation, well, that can be done automatically, except it doesn't do it perfectly, so that has to be checked. And then the Braille placement, well, that doesn't work out correctly every time, so you have to do a little bit of work there, so there's some editing there. Finally, you emboss, emboss at the end. So this is kind of a, a workflow diagram that I've shown many, many times. This is something you probably you'd have to study. Uh, I went through it fairly quickly, but the a date on it. It sort of developed this in 2007. This diagram to show engineering diagram to show the work. So that's sort of what we did in the past, and we've made some books available. We actually did five books, and they're all on our website. So if you do a search uh, for Tactile Graphics University of Washington, you'll find the website for Tactile Graphics.
download all these figures. So you can see the times. So we did a computer architecture book at about 25 minutes per figure, human time, and that was our first book. So we were just learning the process. We didn't have that engineering diagram yet. Next book we did was this pre-calculus book, which had oh, almost 1,100 figures, and we did it in 6.3 minutes per figure. Remarkable. And then we did an astro, modern astrophysics book in minutes per figure. Read math. This was done by a different person. That person learned everything and was able to do it in 8.8 .8 minutes per human time. And then the final one, Introduction to the Theory of Computation, was done by a third person. That was done in 13.3. Those are fairly complicated. So you can see that we're getting about, you know, 10 minutes per figure roughly. I count the first book. Learning, learning curve there. So imagine you had to do those by hand using one of those kits, or you had to do some other process by which you did that it would take. So the, the, I'll talk a little bit about the TGA workflow. The advantage is that you have much faster production. The so on slide 17, uh, the batch processing instead of one figure at a time. So you get to do lots of figures at a time. You don't do one figure at a time. So you might have a group of 300 figures that are kind of similar to the one I showed you here. Once you did this machine learning step, then you do all the figures at one time. You just correct. Um, so a lot of tedious work is avoided, which is good. That makes it a more interesting job. Then the disadvantage is, is well, the ending tactile graphics might not be as good as a custom translation somebody that put a lot of time and effort into it. Um, and the other disadvantage is the work, you know, the, the workforce issue, that uh, a lot of technology needs to be mastered to be able to do this new process. And a lot of the people that are doing tactile graphics these days are not trained in high technology. So um, change of workforce is needed really to make this thing ubiquitous and out there. But it could be a lot faster, and you could have a whole book rather than just a few. Uh, I think people that work in tactile graphics know that, that it takes so long. It takes much longer to just do the graphics in the book than it And that uh, sometimes students only get a few figures in the book because it takes How about just getting all the figures? That's accessible. So on slide 18, I kind of give a comparison to one-offs versus mass production. So I was promoting mass production of. So if you think back in the uh, around the turn of the turn of the century from the from the 19th century to the 20th century, we're now in the 21st century. Uh, automobiles were just coming into existence, and every automobile was a custom automobile. So on the left, I show a picture of a 1960 16 Woods dual power, which is a hybrid. It ran on both fuel and on battery. So hybrids were already around in 19. But it's a beautiful automobile. And then the 1906 Rio, which is another picture on the left. It's, again, another beautiful automobile. And of course, if you ordered one of these automobiles, it might take a year to get it uh, because you know, you'd have to get in line. You have the custom manufacturer that would put it together. But it would be put together to your specifications. You, know, you, you could pick a lot of the features that you wanted in the, in, in the automobile. But only a few people had automobiles in those days, because they were, there was no mass production. So on the right is a picture of an of a assembly line for the Model T uh, from the era of Henry Ford. That's mass production. So now these cars could be produced not one, of, one or two a year, but one or two an hour. And so now, and they could be made much cheaper. Now, they weren't as nice and good as these really custom automobiles and all the, the crafting them, but everybody got one, right? And by you know, a few years, people who even worked in the factory there had their own automobiles. And so automobiles became, if you like, accessible to everybody, not just the few who could afford them and wait to get them. So that's what I'm trying to promote is you know, producing tactile graphics in a more a massive, you know, mass production way. That gives you a lot of background. Now I want to switch gears a little bit. I'm on slide 19. And um, here I'm going to talk about audio tactile graphics. 
And this is not a new concept. There's some really nice work out of uh, Touch Graphics in New York uh, where they built a talking touch tablet, which is on the top. And here you have a tactile graphics, and it's on top of a tablet. If you touch the, the tactile graphic, it touches behind it the tablet, and then it may speak, you know, if you touch an element that's supposed to talk. Now you have a, a tactile graphic where there's speak. This is a, about a 10 by 10. It's the right size. And I have one in my office here, and uh, it's very, very cool. But it, it is pretty heavy. It's not very portable. And it is this extra piece that you have to have around. Furthermore, all the data, all the speech, and all that has to be stored somewhere on a computer. So you can see a cord here where it's connected to not a standalone thing. You have to have a integrated, it's an integrated product. And below is, uh, again, from Touch Graphics, is a digital pen auto tactile, audio, audio tactile graphic. Here is a picture of a digital pen. The little pen has a little camera on the end, and it can sense little dots, little things on the, on the image here, and it'll read out loud what it's supposed to read out loud. So the, the, the voice is actually stored inside the pen and you can hear it. This is a, at least this is a lot lighter. You just have this pen. But again, it's an integrated system. You have to have all the information stored someplace. It has to be loaded onto the pen. And then the pen can recognize uh, where it is on that sheet of paper and read back the, the proper. This looks like some kind of calculator. Cool. So this is really nice work uh, in integrating uh, audio tactile graphics. So for example, if you had somebody, a blind person who was say late blind and really has struggling with braille, um, maybe they could use a tactile graphic like this or you have audio feedback instead of, uh, of having um, braille. So this could be, you know, uh, other way to do also education as well in lower grades. Um, I don't want to say Braille is the wrong way to go. Of course, I don't believe that at all. I think Braille is really, really, uh, but it is an alternative to Braille. Uh, the, the audio, you can store lots more audio than you could ever print all that Braille out of space on the page as well. So the slide 20. So now we're going to move finally to tactile graphics with a voice using QR codes to access text graphics. And that's the title of a paper that we had in October at the uh, ACM SIG Access Conference uh, on it's called Assets 2014. And the co-authors there are uh, Katie Baker, Lauren Milne, Jeff Schofield, Bennett, and myself. And I will mention that Cynthia is, is blind, and she's been a great asset to our, our research team here. So I want to tell you a little about this because I think it's, you know, it's novel, it's different, and I'm not saying it's the final solution, but it's, it's you know, we already show, we saw the, tac, the, the talking talk tablet and we saw the pen and so this is just another another approach uh, to the same idea. So here on slide 21 I have a picture of a typical tactile graphic on the left. Here there are two parabolas, one facing up and one facing left and a dotted line on the diagonal and of course the X and Y axis and there's a bunch of text probably given the equations for the lines and so on. So on the right is the equivalent tactile graphic with a voice. So you can see here, instead of Braille, you have these QR codes. And near the QR code is a little tactile indicator to tell you it's there. Now it could be that, uh, that you have a printer that can emboss, both emboss and print ink, and there are such things. Around. Uh, or you can print these as labels, these little QR codes as labels, and put them onto the now we have a mixed media. We have an embossed, which black is embossed, in which these QR codes, which actually hold text, they're just a way to hold that information, are printed in ink. So it's a mixed media. Um, 
So how do you have how do you get access to this uh, image on the right? On the left, of course, if you read Braille, you're in good shape. You can full image and everything. What's different about the thing on the right here is that everything is there. I don't need a separate, you know, like the like it's not an integrated thing in the sense that I all the information is separate from the tactile graphic. All the information, all the textual information is already on the tactile graphic. It's just stored in these QR codes. So I just need a reader for these QR codes. Well, there's plenty of those around. Um, so you can just read them. So on the next slide, 22, is a picture of somebody trying to, to read QR codes. Just in this picture, there's like a bar chart, and there's lots of QR codes showing the different, uh, what the bars are, what their elements are on, on those bars, both on the X and Y axis. So, well, it may be that you would like to have some assistance in, in using it. So this is a smartphone, and a smartphone QR code reader. So the smartphone has a camera. So you just you have that application going. You point the camera at the QR code, and then it'll read it out loud to you. That's what we would like. Now, on, in this picture, you can actually see three QR codes that are on under the uh, that are all being taken a uh, picture of at the same time. So, which QR codes you should read? So, one technique that we worked on was actually using finger pointing. You want to read the QR code where the finger is pointing. So that's one thing. So one of the disadvantages, as I'll tell you ahead of time, is that your hand is holding this camera, and so it's busy. So you only have one hand to touch the tactile graphic with the key. That's kind of a little bit of a disadvantage. Um, the next slide, I'm going to just show you a video. And before I do, um, I want to tell you a little bit about it. So we, we looked at three modes for using the camera on the smartphone. One mode is it doesn't give you any feedback except that when it finally captures a QR code, it, it reads it to you. Another one is that it gives you a little help. If there's a part of a QR code on the, um, in the field of view, then it might ask you to, to that it'll tell you the QR codes on the top. So if you move the, 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 um, the smartphone a little bit forward toward the top, it'll actually capture it. Or it might tell you that it's not yet in focus. It's focused. Give me some feedback to know what's happening. And then the third mode is the finger pointing I mentioned earlier, that it tries to take a picture of the QR code that's nearest to your. Let's play that now. That background. Let's watch this. Watch this. This is silent mode, no indication of where the codes are. Before we go on, let me just stop that there. Um, that you'll notice that uh, the person that was doing that couldn't tell where the camera was pointing, so was, there were was some long delays. So now let's go to the second one, which is, and here there's just three codes, and they show the different parts of a triangle, the right triangle. And it's really hard to see it because of the resolution. Um, the first one was a, a tactile graphic with the barcodes I mentioned earlier. Trying to read those. One. So now you're getting some feedback, verbal feedback. Zero. TGD, results, zero. Same zero, nothing's in seal of view. One. Oh, I got something. It said it was 24. Scan, tap, two, three. Zero. 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 Top. Top. 24, scan, tap, two, three. Up it there. So what happened there was that, that, that the person was getting feedback. It said zero, zero. That means there's nothing in the field of view. And then finally it said top. So it's in the field of view, but not completely. And then the person moved the camera a little bit forward, and then it finally captured it. That was, that was, and now let's do the finger pointing. Selected. Scan. Zero. So the 
the person is pointing two of three the person is pointing to the QR codes they want to capture they want to picture the camera is looking for the finger and if it finds the finger then it and the code is in in the field of view then it'll read that code out um, and if it's not in the field of view it'll give you some hints how to get it into the field Off. selected scan Ta too too far scanning focusing scanning 20 scan tab 20 then um, so once you've got, uh, you know, you read a bunch of stuff, it stores it all on the phone, and so you can read back what you've just captured. Person, ten. Person's ten. just scanning the phone ten. now, Five. reading the results. That gives you an idea how it works. So I'm moving to slide 23, um, and here we're going to talk about the study that we did uh, testing these three different modes. On the left is the silent mode, so you get no feedback at all, and you just kind of hope that you get a picture of a of a, a, a barcode. Of course, you can feel the barcodes or where they are, so you can have some idea of where to point, but you're not sure that it's in the field. The verbal mode, you get a lot of information about, for example, in this case here, it's showing that the only part of the barcode is there, and so it's saying top, and so it's basically asking you, well, the thing's on the top, give it, you know, get it more into the field of view. So move and finally, the finger pointing mode, where it'll here there's two barcodes shown, but only one where the finger is, and that's the one that'll be read out loud, the one that's near. Um, now, none of these things are uh, perfect. Richard? Yes, question. Richard, yes, it's, question. It's, yes, it's Julie here. I'm going to break in with a question, clarifying question. Somebody asked uh, for the app, the, is that voice over there hearing, or is the voice built into the app? Um, the voice, it's using a combination. VoiceOver is on when there's text to be read and stuff like that. For example, when you do the reviewing. Uh, but when it's doing this um, part here where it's giving you advice about the verbal or the finger pointing, uh, then it's, um, uh, it's, we're just using a custom voice, the same voice as VoiceOver. So VoiceOver wouldn't work on this uh, application without us incorporating the voice into it ourselves. I hope that answers the question. Thanks. Okay, great question. So in our study, we, we had 10 blind users. Four out of 10 were non-Braille readers, and two others were not very fluent in Braille. Uh, they had four tasks. I'll describe them in a moment. I, I mentioned the three modes, and we did it over six sessions because there is a learning curve. Um, at the time to make sure we can get through this. I'm going to try to go through. I think we only have about six more slides. So, so here are the tasks. One task was to just uh, um, give the equation, for example, for the line. There's a picture of a line in a graph, and just find that one barcode and take a picture of it. Another one was there were a number of barcodes on this one parabola there, and you wanted to find the apex of the parabola. Third one was the having a triangle, as I mentioned earlier, a right triangle, so you know where the right angle is because it's tactically shown. And you're asked, what's the, what's the distance, what's the length of the hypotenuse of the triangle? And everybody knew what that meant, of course, the, the 10 people. And the final was the most difficult, was the bar chart. Um, and here, you wanted to find the the two numbers that indicated the highest point in the bar chart, highest point was. You had to have two answers. With. So these were four different tasks. And of course, we did all the right things, and we didn't give tasks. You know, we gave them in, in random order and things like that, all the, the right things in it. Now I'm slide uh, 26, and I'll just give you the highlights of this. So here in this one, we looked at the six sessions. We looked at the average time on all tasks over the six sessions for all the users in the three different modes. So there's, uh, we show three lines, one for each mode, the silent mode, verbal mode, and the finger point. And in the end, uh, the time reduced from about a minute down to about 30 seconds. 
so over the six sessions. So they did improve. They got better at pointing the camera. Uh, in the end, uh, the silent and the uh, verbal modes uh, were the fastest, and the finger pointing would, took the longest, but it was not significant. You know, there's a little bit of difference. 40 seconds versus 30. Um, and so we did our statistical analysis. Go to next one. So here uh, we, we put in a condition because sometimes people just couldn't do it and in in very difficult. So after three minutes, we said, okay, that's enough. So um, we didn't count those in the, in, the, in, the, in the numbers I showed you in the previous slide. So this chart here shows the number of timeouts per session. It also shows in what modes those timeouts so, for example, in the first session, there were 19 timeouts by all the 19, excuse me, by the 10 users. So, and, you know, pretty much it was in the silent mode and the finger pointing. But by the second session, the number of timeouts had reduced to about, um, about eight. And by the final session, that sixth session, there were only two timeouts. And those two timeouts were, one was in the silent mode and one was in the verbal. So you can see that, again, that's the learning curve. People got better uh, taking pictures uh, of these barcodes. That's a, a nice indicator that getting down to just two timeouts was not too bad. And these timeouts pretty much all occurred on the bar charts. Because Go to slide 28, and here it shows the accuracy because when they did give an answer, it might not be the correct answer. Uh, and sometimes it was close, and so there was you either got zero, one, or two, depending on how accurate you were. Um, and this chart does a lot of data, and it's in the notes. All the data is in the notes. Um, to read those, you can. But uh, pretty much the accuracy was around. Uh, 90 to 95 percent, except for the bar chart where it was more like between 70. Um, so that just indicates the bar chart was the hardest task. You had to find these barcodes, uh, two of them, for example. In fact, in that video I showed you, there was a mistake. So the mistake might be for the person or it might be the software. And here, I think it's the software. We, we can't see these people were. Um, so, in terms of preference, uh, there's no one preference. Uh, four people really like the silent mode. To be honest, uh, I use screen readers every day, and I'm sick of the electronic noise. Uh, four people preferred the finger pointing. I like the concept of the finger pointing. I feel more confident that since it looks for a finger, it's getting the right QR code if you have multiple codes on the same page. And then two preferred verbal. So the other thing I like about verbal mode is that every time I hear a zero, I think, so I do need to move this thing a little bit. So they, they did like the feedback. So there's no preference. So this is, with a lot of things that you build for people who are blind, you want to give options. So we're not going to say, well, we're just going to give you one of these. We'll give you all of them. Let me move on to slide. Uh, so we did a little com uh, comparison with Braille. Um, in the study, of, uh, um, we had 82 images of, uh, in the pre-calculus book that we looked at, and, and the QR codes were quite a bit smaller. So on average, they were about 225 square millimeters, while the Braille was about 320. So this, you know, intuitively you know that would be true, that the QR codes are going to be. So that's no surprise. When we uh, asked the Braille readers to, uh, we, we had the very same tactile graphics, and in the sixth session we asked the Braille readers to, to give us, to do those four tasks. And it took them about the same amount of time using Braille as using the QR codes. So that's somewhat encouraging that, that, uh, that the software, the uh, does, is, is helpful, and that this tactile graphics with a voice is a possibility. Not that much slower or as slow as 
Well, Braille is about the same amount of time. So our codes and that. So I do need to move a little bit faster, so I'll go quick with this. Uh, again, accuracy was about the same for Braille, because um, I want to leave time for questions. So why don't we stop now and see if, uh, Julie, if you have some questions. I notice there's some extra slides here. I don't know what they're for. Okay, yes, this is Julie. Those, those are just the uh, wrap-up slides that um, uh, we'll get to after the questions. So uh, um, let me jump in. We do, we do have a few questions that came in over chat. Um, <coughs> and let's see, Jack asks, uh, have studies of reading comprehension been done for this style of graphics compared to Braille labeled graphics? Uh, no, Jack, that we haven't done the reading comprehension. We gave pretty tactile graphics related uh, tasks to do, you know, find the length of the hypotenuse of a right triangle. So, um, and people did make mistakes um, and and in some cases, it did have to do with reading comprehension. Some of the Braille readers were not used to the Lemus code or, you know, the codes that we were using, so that was a problem. But that would be an interesting thing. One thing I should say about comprehension is when you listen to text being read to you or you read the Braille, maybe somebody has a reading comprehension test that's just done that already, you know, nothing to do with tactile graphics. Okay, thank you. Another question from Susan. Uh, she's interested in getting some more information about math OCR programs and wonders if you have anything to suggest. Sure. Um, the one, the most famous one is called Infinity Reader, I-N-F-T-Y Reader. And I noticed that it's available on uh, what's it called, Ideal Group. Um, and I bet those people that developed that, it's a remarkable product. Developed in Japan, so I, I take a look at the Infinity Reader. Okay, thank you. And then uh, so a couple of people remarked you had a slide um, of a tactile graphics kit, and a couple of people yeah. remarked it was American Printing House for the Blind that makes that kit. Oh, so great! Thank you. Thank you for that comment. Um, uh, I, should have, I should have had that on there. <laughs> um, then a question from Supada, she, uh, asking, when creating a Braille tactile graphic, what other information, what's the information that needs to be included? Uh, that's a really good question. <laughs> I'm, it, this answer will take a little time. Um, so the philosophy that we took uh, when we did our books, remember those five books, was we included everything. That we, we wanted the same information that the sighted person got, that the blind person got. Didn't remove, when we removed the text, we put it back in in Braille, somewhere, very near where it was in the original document. Uh, now, I will say, there were a few exceptions. There were some exceptions, um, and the exceptions were very complicated diagrams where the, if we tried to put all the text back in in Braille, it would not fit. So, for example, there was a diagram that had a, you know, a, a sort of a picture of a circle with all the, the radians around the circle, you know, the degrees, and it had, you know, lots of them, you know, maybe 30 of them. They just wouldn't fit. And so we just said, well, well let's, let's do half of them. We did 15 of them. We left all the tactile graphic there. We left the tactile graphic there, and um, but we reduced the amount of text. So we tried. And then there's one other example that I wanted to mention. So in this uh, free calculus book, there were graphs that had the lines. You know, the the x. You know, for every x coordinate, it had the vertical line there. So so had this tactile graphics with graphical elements on it but you also had the grid lines behind it. And this was a, well, a long discussion with some blind people. What should we do? What should we do? And we decided just to remove them. 
we took the grid lines out. And um, and then that made the tactile graphic a lot simpler. And easier. so for the most part, I'd say 90% of the time we did nothing. We just put everything back in. But for 10% of the time, we did a little bit of editing to make it reasonable, to make it a readable tactile graphic. So I'm sorry that answer was so long, but that gives you some idea of what we did. Thank you. Um, several more questions, and I'll say uh, to people, if we do run out of time, uh, we will answer all your questions. We'll post the Q&A in a sheet uh, on the site afterwards, so don't feel uh, discouraged if we don't get to your question live on the air. But we do have time for a couple of more. Uh, Danielle asks, did you create the QR codes separately from the graphics? Yes. Uh, but did we separate the QR code? The, yeah, we had to because there's um, – it's a little bit complicated, but first of all, we didn't want to purchase a printer that printed both uh, the embossing and the ink. Too much expense. So just because we were doing a study, we actually printed the QR codes on just like label paper and cut them out and pasted them on onto the tactile graphic. Of course, the tactile graphic had no braille on it by that time, but we put those QR codes where they belong, where the text was. So to do a mass production with the QR codes, it, we would want to do something better than, you know, cut and paste those QR codes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Magda asks, is this available for Mac and Windows platforms? Um, let's see. What I, I'm not sure if speaking by what is available, so let me just say what is available. So we have um, the Tactile Graphics Assistant that I mentioned is available uh, as an application that runs on Windows. Um, don't believe it runs on a Mac. Uh, for the QR code reader that we developed, uh, there is an iOS version of that, so it runs on an iPhone, but it does not include the finger pointing yet, so we want to add that. So we did the finger pointing for the experimental one, but we did not include it to the one that's available on. Uh, okay. Um, thank you. And Paul asks, uh, he, he says this is very interesting, would you consider using any supplementary information? For instance, how many QR codes there are in a diagram so that the user knows that they have found all the required information? Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea, Paul. No, we did not consider that, but I think that's a great consideration. Uh, one idea that we have is to put and now this will take a, a, about a minute to explain that um, since we know how to master the finger pointing, that maybe we could just say, you know, if we know where the person is pointing on the paper, we could have stored someplace all the information that should be read at that time. So we don't need a QR code on the paper at all. But you do need to get that information into, you know, into the phone somehow. You need to get the XY coordinates of where you're pointing. So, um, so we can do that with one sort of giant QR code that we could paste on the back of the paper. Take a picture of that. Once we have a picture of that, that stores all the information about where the tactile elements are and what they are and where they should be. Now you just have finger pointing. So you just have one QR code that does everything. So in that sense, what we could do for that is we could always say, okay, when you load that onto your phone, when you take that one picture of the big QR code, it'll tell you how many there are. That's a great idea. Okay, and I will say that unfortunately we are out of time, uh, but there are several more questions here. So uh, what we will do is um, uh, capture the questions. We will um, provide the answers to everybody on a Word document that I will post to the site. And I just want to thank uh, Richard very much for this fantastic presentation. If you enjoyed this webinar, please know uh, that Diagram gives these webinars quarterly. And uh, um, we have a library of them that are archived on our webinars page. 
uh, that you can visit and download at your leisure, and that's where a recording of this webinar will also appear in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, if you want more information about Diagram Center research, uh, you can find us on Twitter. You can email us. Uh, if you write to info at diagramcenter.org, uh, you'll get to me, and I can connect you with um, any information you may need. And I just want to say thank you, everybody, for spending this time with us. Um, really appreciate it. A big round of applause to Richard. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. And thank everybody for coming. Thank everybody for coming. Bye.